All right. We're picking up in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Um, just by way of review, so, so far we started uh, three weeks ago, and we have been going through the first six chapters. Um, how did we get here? We started out with Elkanah, right? Elkanah and his wife, and the provocation that his other wife was causing his first wife, and then that led to Samuel. And then we read about um, Samuel's birth and his dedication to the Lord. And we talked about kind of this split screen where we were looking at Eli and kind of contrasting Eli and his sons and their behavior and their um, just total disobedience to their, um, their role in the tabernacle. And we compared that to how Samuel was being raised and his dedication to the Lord. And um, we talked about uh, Eli's kind of um, poor job of, of correcting this behavior in his sons. And then you'll remember that um, that ultimately led to this kind of pronouncement against the house of Eli that they would no longer continue in their duties and that furthermore that sons were going to die. And so uh, we went through that uh, last week. And then um, after we kind of took a step away from Eli and his sons and Samuel, and for the last two chapters, there's been this kind of, um, the ark was taken. Remind, you remember we talked about the fact that they, they called on the ark they were going to battle with the Philistines, and they called on the ark and treated it as almost this kind of special token rather than recognizing the Lord who is behind it. And as a consequence, the ark's taken, and it's been traveling around, and um, that ultimately resulted in you know, bad things happening to the people that contained the ark, and so they want to give it back. So that's kind of the context for where we are, where here in the first uh, two verses, the, they, they, have, they eventually returned the ark. So they've, they've brought the ark back to the Israelites. And in verse 1, it says it brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill. <clears throat> in verse 2, from the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jerim, a long time past, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So we're going to uh, expound on that in just a second, what it meant that they were lamenting after the Lord. But I think this, the, the next few verses kind of um, put some more on the table in terms of what might have been going on during this 20 years. So we haven't seen Samuel in a couple of chapters. Now he comes back. Read verses 3 and 4 with me of 1 Samuel 7. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. So I think this reveals to us a little bit about what, um, what was in the hearts of the Israelites versus what their behavior was. So I open this up. What, what conclusions can you draw about what was going on with the Israelites during this 20 years based on what Samuel says to them? They were worshiping other gods. Okay, so it mentions Baal and the Ashtaroth. So, um, you know, these different pagan gods had um, special uh, purposes or thoughts that they had certain activities, so Baal, the god of the weather that was responsible for crops and harvest. And then Ashtaroths, which are um, the goddesses of fertility, so it's connected to love and childbearing. Um, what, what do you think then it meant then in verse 2 that it says that they were lamenting? What, more broadly, what does it mean to lament? If I lament something, what does that mean? What's that? To cry for? Okay. So expressing... Um, sadness or sorrow or grief or remorse, okay? And so help me reconcile that. We, they, they, they were kind of sorrowful, yet they've been worshiping these other gods. And then what's, what, what do they apparently want to do from what Samuel says to them? That's right. And what would we call that nowadays? In the New Testament vernacular, we would say they're wanting to, they're wanting to repent, right? They want to repent. They're seeking repentance. And so then what does Samuel tell them if they want to repent? What do they need to do? Yes, ma'am. Put away their idols. Well, I'm sorry, I cut you off. 
put away their idols and return to the Lord? Absolutely, right? So they apparently have a heart to change, right? But their behavior hasn't caught up with what was in their heart. Um, and that's what he's kind of admonishing them to do, right? Your, your heart's in the right spot. You want to return to the Lord, but, um, but you've got to change your behavior to do that. Yes, sir. Okay, so some motivation to, right? So they're trying to maybe, they see the situation that they're in and they don't want to uh, have bad things happening to them, sure. Um, you know, we could speculate about what exactly they had been doing. I, I don't want to uh, put too much on this, but it says, he says, you know, direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. So the message is not you need to start serving the God. Perhaps they're trying to serve both. Right? Perhaps that's the message, is you're trying to serve both God and these idols, and that just doesn't work, and so the message is serve him only. But you know, if we were to broadly characterize this, I'd say that um, repentance of the heart will ne necessitate a change in behavior. Right? They want to change, they have a heart to change, but for them to change, it's going to require them doing some things differently, and that's what he's telling them to do. Um, <clears throat> So that's certainly application for us, right? Our behavior should be consistent with what's in our heart. If we're going to change our heart, then we have to change the way that we act, the way that we speak, we talk. Um, I want to point out kind of some eerie similarities between what's happening here and, um, and Mount Sinai. So remember where the ark is right now. It's up on a hill, right? Abinadab's house up on a hill. And remember what's in the ark are these tablets of stone, amongst other things. And so you've got, um, you've got the people um, trying to take matters into their own hands, worshiping these false gods, all the while um, not being patient and waiting on the Lord. There's kind of some familiarity to kind of how the Israelites behave right when they came out of Egypt, right? And um, we're going to see that kind of harken back to uh, later in this chapter. Um, I underline this direct your heart to the Lord from verse, uh, verse 3. I mean... It's just such a, um, it's a neon sign based on what we've been talking about so far this quarter and, and um, focusing on the heart. Um, I think that's a great just expression. I mean, there's probably sermons that could be preached on what that means to direct your heart to the Lord. Um, and I also made a note to myself that this reminds me of what Scott Byer often says is something they practice in their family, which is you've got this, um, this dilemma where their heart wants to do one thing, but their behavior doesn't match it. And I always think about Scott Byer talking about the practice of having his family be like chalk, that what you see on the outside is what's on the inside, right? And that's the lesson that, that Samuel is speaking to them. You want to be consistent. If, you're gonna, if you want to do one thing with your life, then you should match it on the inside. So if this is your heart to serve the Lord, then your behavior should imitate that. Yes. Absolutely. And to kind of tie it in to what we're going to read in the next chapter, you know, they want a king, and so they, they want to follow God, but they also want a king who's going to do all these other things. So there's this kind of friction between the head and the heart and what they want versus what they know they should be doing. Gary. Absolutely. Right, right. In 20 years, you know, this is a, basically a generation that's passed of, of kind of doing what they saw fit, and, and now here they are trying to, to repent. Um, all right, verse 5, it says, um, So Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I'll pray to the Lord for, for 
you. Um, just a, anybody recognize the significance of Mizpah? Anybody recognize where Mizpah has shown up before? Bible trivia question. Um, back when, um, have it, back when uh, Jacob separated from Laban, so he, Jacob left with Leah and Rachel, and Rachel had stolen Laban's idols, and so he catches up with them, and they make this covenant. And um, so there's this kind of moment of separation between Jacob with his daughters and Laban, and that happens at Mizpah. There, it also is mentioned elsewhere in Judges that when, um, you recall, when the nation of Israel goes to like civil war with the tribe of Benjamin because they um, uh, sexually assault this concubine that was married to a Levite, and all that happened at Mizpah. They met at Mizpah, and that's where this happened. So not a totally unfamiliar place so far in the Old Testament. Look at verse 6. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Anybody have thoughts about what this act of drawing some water and pouring it out might represent? It's used elsewhere in the Old Testament in Lamentations chapter. Two. It gives a little bit more color to it. In Lamentations 2, it says, Arise, cry out in the night, at the beginning of the night, watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. So there's this idea of like, like emptying your heart before God. So just putting it all out there and, and expressing everything that's in your heart. It says, verse 7, Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And so, so what's happening? So the Philistines hear that the Israelites have gathered, and they want to fight them, and so the people are afraid. They ask Samuel to pray for them. I'll point out the bit of irony here, right? You remember back in chapter 4, when they were afraid of the Philistines, excuse me, they should have been afraid of the Philistines, but they weren't, right? So they, they need to be afraid, and they weren't, and then they end up losing to the Philistines and they, because they treated the ark like this token. And so now, here we are in chapter 7, and the Lord is on their side. They're trying to repent. They don't really have a reason to be afraid, but now they are, and yet they, they win against the Philistines. So, um, so you've seen this kind of change in behavior. This time they don't cry out for the ark, right? They cry out, they, they beckon Samuel to cry out to the Lord, not... <clears throat> that word cry out to is also alternatively translated like call upon. So you think about that expression of calling upon the Lord. That's kind of what they were doing here. Verse 9. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Bethkar. <clears throat> so how does Samuel respond to their, their request? They, what did they request him to do? Back in verse 8. To, to cry out to the Lord, but how does Samuel respond? What does he do first? He makes an offering, right? So he has this, basically, an atoning sacrifice, a whole burnt offering. Uh, we can go over to Leviticus and read Leviticus 1. This is like a typical uh, atoning sacrifice that they would offer. And so, you know, lesson for us, they're, they're trying to approach God. Their sin stands in the way. What do they have to do before they can approach God? There has to be a sacrifice to atone for their sin, to allow them to approach God. Verse 12, then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So, uh, so we think about this song right here, I raised by Ebenezer. Here's Samuel setting up a stone as a memorial to remind them of what God has done, a stone of help. Either by thy help I've come. This is God, a, a way of reminding them that God has helped them up to this point. Um, you know, this is not the only place you see these kind of memorials set up, right? This is done throughout the Old Testament. Noah set up a memorial. 
Moses set up a memorial. Um, these were markers to remind themselves. You can imagine future generations passing by, and they say, I remember. You told me about this. We, we've heard that story. That's what that marker is there for. And, you know, it's also interesting to think about that this memorial was not just a reminder of what God did for them. This memorial is also a reminder of what they had done to get in that spot, right? So this is a reminder both of, of their sin and their disobedience and where that took them. And when they repented and when they offered to sacrifice God's um, salvation of them from the, from the torture. Oh. All right, so in what ways was Samuel an antitype or a shadow of Jesus that we see throughout this chapter? Okay, that's... That's right, that's right. Samuel was an intercessor between the people and God. He communicated with the people and then communicated with God. Jesus does the same for us, absolutely. What other ways? I'm sorry? That's right, that's right. He was involved in offering this atoning sacrifice. Here, it's Samuel offering a lamb. Um, Jesus, of course, offered himself. So they were both involved in the sacrifice to atone for sin. What other ways? What did he start out? What did Samuel start out by doing back in verse 3? He called on them to re return, repent. Yeah, a call to repent. What does it say Samuel did in verse um, 3? Lost it. He judged them. Uh, verse 6, and Samuel judged the people. Uh, Acts 10.42, Jesus has been appointed by God as the judge of the living and the dead. He was a judge. Called them to repent, judge the people, intercessing uh, the atoning sacrifice. And because of the intercession, it results in salvation for the people, right? So, you know, I think it's really a beautiful, just in one succinct little chapter, this beautiful shadow of what Jesus does for us that's laid out um, here in 1 Samuel 7. Um, all right, so, th so they have victory such that the Philistines are subdued. And then verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there he also judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. So the chapter ends kind of with this commentary on Samuel, the work that he's doing the rest of his life. Um, I made a note to myself, just uh, there's no punchline here, but just the importance of prayer, right? So um, Samuel prayed as an intercession on their behalf. Israel was able to, you know, confess their sins and repent, and, and God hears their prayer and answers them. Um, any other thoughts on chapter 7 before we move on to chapter 8? Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, their, their call, once again, is not on Samuel to, to go and get the ark. Their call, they have the ark. Their call on Samuel is to, is to speak to the Lord. And that's what's missing back in chapter 4, right? The, their reaction was, why has the Lord defeated us? Let's get the ark. And so you see this total misplacement of who they should be directing their concerns to. And, and they're not even acknowledging God's role in all of this, right? They're, again, as we talked about last week, so as God did so eloquently, they were treating this thing just like a token that they could like a magic genie in a bottle that they could rub, and that would save them. Of course, it didn't work. Any other thoughts on chapter 7?
Yeah, it... I agree. It, it's an endearing thought that they included that detail, especially given all of this emotional story we get back in chapter one of what his mom went through, but making the coats for him and all that stuff, that was kind of weird. <clears throat> all right, chapter eight. So it's kind of in a transition point now. We've been focusing really on Samuel starting in chapter one and kind of his work through chapter seven. And now, um, now we, for the next few chapters, we're going to talk about Israel's desire for a king. So. Um, they're going to express that desire. They're going to go. Samuel's going, they're going to incidentally, kind of in this uh, very interesting way, find their king, and then he's going to be anointed, selected and anointed. So start with me in verse 1. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. So time has passed. Interesting that we've basically kind of followed the entirety of Samuel's life now. Now he's an old man. And they actually say that to him when they approach him. They say, you're old. <laughs> like, Thank you, I know. So um, they, so he, he's, there's this kind of transition, too, with Samuel. And so he has kind of a, a poor plan for his succession. Why would you say that it was a bad idea to make his sons the next judges over Israel? Any speculation on that? Okay. So proves in the pudding. They do a bad job of it. They clearly weren't fit for it. Okay. Why else? Okay, yeah, so, right, that you should have been aware of their behavior and the choices they would make, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's pretty ironic as well that you think about Samuel and what he saw and the message that God gave him. And so he knew, he saw firsthand what happened with Eli and his children. And yet here he is. I also think, you know, and I, it's easy for me to conflate these, but, you know, because Eli was a priest and he was a judge. And the priesthood was something that was inherited, right? Whereas these judges had been kind of appointed by God for very kind of select purposes. So I don't think we really have precedent, someone correct me if I'm wrong, for this judgeship being passed down through progeny. This was like an appointed role that God gave to men. Samuel was appointed to be a judge. So even though the, the priesthood was something that was inherited, the judgeship was something that was appointed individually. Um, but obviously it's a bad plan. They don't walk in his ways. They turn aside after gains. These guys are susceptible to bribes or wanting money or corruption. And so for these reasons, the elders gather together and they say, Samuel, here's what we want you to do. We want you to appoint us a king to rule over us, uh, to judge us like all the nations, were their words. All right? So, you know, we didn't study judges immediately preceding this, but when you go back through judges, we've referenced this multiple times, that they, there, there was no king in Israel, and so the people did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel, chapter 18. There was no king in Israel, chapter 19. It's all throughout judges. And so there was this system that they had been existing under, no one called a government, but God's kind of plan over them was they would have these judges, the judge would rule. You know, this was the pattern that we learned. They would appoint a judge, the judge would rule. Things would go well for a while. They would fall away, the whole thing would collapse, and God would appoint this new judge. So let me ask this question. Do you think it was unreasonable 
if, if that's in your mind, this is the pattern, we have this kind of inconsistency with rotating cast of leaders for our country, do you think it's unreasonable for them to request a king? You think it was unreasonable? Okay. Okay. Right, right. So, yes, so the, it's revealed in their motives that they were doing it for the wrong reasons. Any, anyone think it was a reasonable request for them to request a king? We have a taker? Oh, tell me more. What did what you say? Okay, turn with me to Deuteronomy. I'm sorry, what did you say? De Deuteronomy 17. Let's turn there. Deuteronomy 17. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 14. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it, and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he mul greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So, yeah, so there's an argument that this was something that they had told would be allowed at some point, that they would have a king. In fact, if you go back to uh, Gideon, yeah, in, in Judges chapter 8, um, they had already almost reached this point. Back when in Judges with Gideon, they come to him in, in Judges 8, 22, and they say, rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. So you see this almost taking place at some point back in Judges, but it doesn't. We can look at Gideon's response in a little bit, but it doesn't happen then. So maybe now they think, well, now this is the time that it's supposed to happen. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to unpack that in a few minutes about what God allows people to do, right? You think about Romans 1 and giving them up to you know, their own exception. Yes, ma'am. Right, so we're going to talk in a minute about what kind of king, what Samuel warns them a king will be like, and we're going to compare that to the kind of king that God would allow back in Deuteronomy. Matt, do you have a comment?
Absolutely. I agree. Um, let's read. It says, but the thing displeased Samuel, and they said, give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So how does he respond to this? He prays, and we see how God responds. God says that we've just talked about, Samuel, you're going to obey them. This is not about you. It's about me, so give them a king. But he tells him, warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So first question, do you think that this was how Samuel expected God to react? No. I agree. No. So what is it that God tells him, this, this, this expression, show them the ways, that, that ways there is alternatively translated justice. So in other words, show them the kind of justice they will get when they have a king for themselves. If they want a king like all the other nations, then let them know what the price is that they're going to have to pay for it. So let's read that. So Moses tells them to be, so, excuse me, uh, Samuel. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain he will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. So what were they asking for? Were they asking for a king or were they asking to be like everybody else? They're, they're really saying, God, you know, we, we don't want to be your chosen people. We don't want to be this set-apart nation. We want to be like everyone else. And so what does God say to Samuel to warn them about? He says, then you're going to get exactly the punishment of, of receiving what you want, right? You're going to receive the consequences of getting exactly what you want. I often think about um, in the Sermon on the Mount, about raising, uh, setting up treasures on earth versus treasures in heaven. You know, there's an unspoken uh, implication there, which is we're all laying up treasure somewhere, right? We're going to be rich in the things that we want to be rich in. And if you want to be rich in a king who's going to do all these things to you, then God will let us have it, right? Um, and, you know, so his, his willingness to give them what they want is really a judgment on them that they're going to receive exactly what they want. Um, I mentioned earlier Romans chapter 1. Over in Romans chapter 1, uh, starting in verse um, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And it talks about, you know, since the creation of the world, we can clearly see God's attributes. and then verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful and became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Verse 24, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. This is the idea, right? God giving people exactly what they ask. These people wanted a king. He's telling them exactly what kind of king they were going to get. And they want it anyway, and so God says, well, here's the consequences that, that you're going to get. What's the, what does it say, verses uh, 11 through 17, what is the expression that you see over and over? He will, he will take. This is a king who will take. He will take their sons, their daughters, their fields, uh, their vineyards, their grains, um, yeah, big government, right? 
pretty much. He's a God who takes. And verse 17, they will be his slaves. So, you know, he, he mentions back in verse, um, uh, since they came up out of Egypt, verse 8. So he, you know, according to all the deeds they've done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, they've been forsaking me and serving other gods. And what does God say is going to happen if they get the king that they want? They're going to be servants again. They're going back into slavery. Um, remember, this has been the pattern that they've been kind of listening to judges. They've had stability. They don't listen. They fall away and repeat. And they think that a king is going to fix this problem. But really, the secret is they're, they're, they're looking for stability, but they're actually just trading themselves in to be slaves once again. Um, and then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he kind of drives it home, verse 18, that you know, you're going to end up crying because of this king whom you have chosen for yourself. So there will be no question about who the responsibility will land on because God will let them choose whatever they want to choose, and if this is what they choose, then he will let them have it. Does this change their minds? No. Verse 19, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we, may, that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the, and when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to a city. So another bit of irony here, right? Um, the people are refusing to listen to what Samuel has to say, and what, yet what does God tell Samuel? He tells him to listen to the people. Um, I, I wanted to draw this comparison. Um, so, again, it's what they're going to get, first of all, the king that they're going to get is a king who will take. Is that the kind of king that's described back in Deuteronomy that we read about? Yeah. The king that we read about in Deuteronomy that God would allow was someone who wouldn't be caught up with money, who wouldn't be caught up in wives, who would have a heart after God. So here's God telling him, like, that's not the king that you're going to get. If this, is what, if this is the motive that you're seeking it from. And then what, so compare and contrast the king that's described here in the 8th chapter with what kind of king that Jesus is. Is, is Jesus a king who takes, or is Jesus a king who gives? Can you think of any passages from the New Testament that, of, of, Literal translation, I give or Jesus gives blank. That's right. He, the Son of Man came, Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. To give his life as a ransom for many. John 10, 28. I give them eternal life. Matt 11, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me and I will give you rest. So, this, this beautiful contrast between the kind of king who's going to take and the false choice that they're making with what they think they're getting from that king versus the king that we have in Jesus, a king who gives life, who gives rest, who gives peace. Um, so that was a nice contrast. Uh, any thoughts about chapter 8? Yeah, so um, exactly right. They, you almost can't talk sense into them. He, he lists all these awful things. Certainly no one would choose those, asp 
uh, attributes in a king, and yet they say, we don't care. We want a king anyway. So, so speaking to God's providence, even allowing people to make bad choices and still working through those bad choices, we certainly see that in the Bible. Yeah. Any other thoughts on chapter 8? Yes, sir. Right, and so again, kind of what they're giving up in exchange to get this king, right? They've, at least God has always responded to them when they've tried to come back to him. And here he says, oh, you'll call and I won't answer. Any other thoughts? I probably should have made more time for this, but there's, there's probably a whole conversation we could have about so take, take away the idea of a king as being what they're choosing. And just, you know, they're choosing self over God. And that's applicable to us, right? It's not, we're not picking a king today, but we're picking, so, if, we're, if we're not choosing God, we're picking something else. And, and we're choosing to believe the lie that they believed, where they thought that it would give them X or Y or make them like other people. And yet, when we make that choice, you know, do we lie to ourselves in that same situation? It's not a king, but it's time or money or however we spend our, our resources away from God. We always regret it. All right, thank you guys for your attention and your participation. Scott, where are we covering next Wednesday? 9, 10, and 11. Maybe 12. 13. He says 13. <laughs>